Chapter 28. Pincer's Flat. It was both. Meyer, human but cat-connected many generations from the past, was fighting for his life. Meyer was a small, slight man who weighed little. Five Meyers equaled the weight of fat crow, and two Meyers equaled the weight of thin crow, which meant that against the crow twins, Meyer was effectively outnumbered seven to one. Meyer had been on the watching platform when the crows and Jakey Fry had staggered in with their ropes and thrown them to the floor. Meyer had asked about the ropes and what they were for, and was told, "'Nothing for you to bother about. Not where you're going.' One look at Jakey Fry's terrified face told Meyer all he needed to know. He had scuttled up the foot-pole, a pole with footrests placed on either side, thrown open a trap-door, and taken refuge in a place that normally no one would have dared to follow, the Arena of the Light. The Arena of the Light was the circular space at the very top of the lighthouse. In the center of the circle burned the sphere of light, a large round sphere of brilliant white light. The light was encircled by a narrow white marble walkway. Behind the light, on the island side of the lighthouse, was a huge curved plate of gleaming silver, which Meyer polished every day. On the seaward side were two enormous glass lenses, which Meyer also polished every day. The lenses were set a few feet back from the two almond-shaped openings, the eyes, through which the light was focused. The eyes were four times the height of Meyer, and six times as long. They were open to the sky, and as Meyer slammed the trapdoor shut and fastened it down, a fresh summer breeze scented with sea blew in and made the catman feel sad. He wondered if this would be the very last morning he would ever smell the sea air. The only hope that Meyer had was that the crows would be too scared to come up to the arena of the light. After many generations, Meyer's family had adapted to the light by growing secondary dark eyelids, light lids, through which they could see without being blinded by the light. But anyone without that protection who looked straight at the light would find that its brilliance seared the eyes and left scars in the center of vision, so that forevermore they would see the shape of the sphere of light in a black absence of vision. But when a battering began on the underside of the trap door, Meyer knew his hope was in vain. He crouched beside the light and listened to the thuds of thin crow's fists on the flimsy metal of the trap door, which was made only to be light-tight, not crow-proof. He knew it would not last long. Suddenly the trapdoor flew off its hinges, and Meyer saw Thin Crow's shaven head sticking through the hole in the walkway, wearing two dark blue ovals of glass over his eyes, looking like one of the giant insects that invaded his worst nightmares. Meyer was terrified. He realized that whatever it was the crows were about to do had been carefully planned. Thin Crow pulled himself onto the walkway, and Meyer waited, determined that whichever way Thin Crow came at him, he would go the other. They could go on a long time like that, he thought. But Meyer's hopes were suddenly dashed. Fat Crow's head, complete with insect eyes, appeared through the trap door. With utter horror and amazement, Meyer watched Thin Crow heave his brother through the tiny hole and pull him out onto the walkway where he lay, winded like a blubbery fish on a slab. Meyer closed his eyes. This, he thought, is the end of Meyer. Now the crows began their party piece, the pincer splat. It was something that they had practiced down many a dark alley in the port. The pincer began when, very slowly, they would approach a terrified victim from either side. The victim would watch one, then the other, trying desperately to figure out which way to run. Then, at the very moment of decision, the crows would pounce. Splat. And so it was with Meyer. He shrank back against the wall, opposite the trap door, and through his light lids he watched his nightmares come true. Slowly, slowly, stepping carefully along the marble walkway, with tight little smiles and fingers flexing, the crows came at him from both sides, inexorably drawn closer. The crows herded Meyer toward the eyes of the lighthouse, as he had known they would. Finally he stood in the space between the eyes, his back to the wall, and he wondered which eye they would throw him out of. He cast a glance at the rocks far below. It was a long way down, he thought, a very long way down. He said a silent goodbye to his light. Splat! The crows pounced. Working in harmony the only time they ever did, they grabbed Meyer and lifted him high. Meyer let out a yowl of terror, and way down the lighthouse on the fourth platform, Lucy and Wolfboy heard it and got goosebumps. The crows, surprised at the lightness of the catman, were caught off balance. Twisting and spitting, more like a snake than a cat, Meyer flew out of their grasp, up in the air, 
out through the left eye and into the empty sky. For a fraction of a second, which felt like an eternity to Meyer, he hung poised between the crow's throw and gravity's pull. He saw four bizarre images of himself reflected in the crow's insect eyes. He was apparently flying and screaming at the same time. He saw his precious sphere of light for what he was sure would be the last time, and then he saw the rush of black as the wall of the lighthouse flashed past him at literally breakneck speed. Cat-like, Meyer automatically turned so that he faced the ground, and as he fell, the rush of wind forced his arms and legs into a star shape, causing his sealskin cloak to spread out like a pair of bat's wings. Meyer's plummet turned to a gentle glide, and had a gust of wind not knocked him against the side of the lighthouse, he would very likely have landed on the marauder directly below. And so it was that Meyer used up one more of his original nine lives, leaving six remaining. He had used one when he was a baby, and had fallen in the harbor, and another when his cousin had disappeared. Lucy and Wolfboy did not hear the sickening thud of Meyer hitting the lighthouse wall. It was masked by the clang of Theodophilus Fortitude Fry's approaching footsteps. Lucy and Wolfboy had not moved from the landing. The terrible yowl from above had sent a chill through both of them, and as Skipper Fry's steps neared the final turn up to the landing, Wolfboy whispered, "'It will be us next.' Wide-eyed, Lucy nodded. Wolfboy pushed against the door behind them, and to his surprise it opened. Quickly he and Lucy slipped inside and found themselves in a small room furnished with three sets of bare bunks and a locker-like cupboard. Silently Wolfboy closed the door and began to bolt it, but once again Lucy stopped him. "'He'll know for sure that we're in here if you do that,' she whispered. "'Our only chance is for him to look and not find us. That way he'll think we've gone on ahead.' The footsteps drew nearer. Wolfboy thought fast. He knew that Lucy was right. He also knew that Theodophilus Fortitude Fry was bound to search every inch of the bunk room, and he didn't see where Lucy thought they could hide. The tiers of metal bunks were devoid of any covering, including mattresses, and the only place that offered any concealment was the locker where the skipper was sure to look. The footsteps stopped on the landing. Wolfboy grabbed hold of Lucy, pushed her into the locker, squeezed in behind her, and closed the door. Lucy looked aghast. "'What did you do that for?' she mouthed. "'He's bound to look in here.' "'Did you have any better ideas?' hissed Wolfboy. "'Jump him,' said Lucy. "'Hit him on the head.' "'Shh!' Wolfboy put his finger to his lips. "'Trust me.' Lucy thought that she didn't have a lot of choice. She heard the door to the bunk room open, and the heavy footsteps of the skipper clump inside. They stopped right outside the locker." and the sound of labored wheezing came through the flimsy door. "'You can come out here,' came the skipper's rasp. "'I got better things to do than play drat and hide-and-seek.' There was no response. "'I'm telling you both. You've had it easy up till now, but it'll be worse for you if you don't come out.' The door handle rattled angrily. "'You've had your chance. Don't say I didn't tell you.' The door was thrown open. Lucy opened her mouth to scream. 